five uh, minutes for, for the intro and then half, half an hour for the talk. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, uh, Dr. Dixit. This is Dr. Balsubramaniam and hello, Banamurti. Oh, hello. Uh, nice to meet you and thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah it's a pleasure. I mean, it's a privilege to be chairing a session to, uh, from you. Actually, you have a good idea, Dr. Balsubramaniam. Yeah. I should also get my uh, earphones to avoid echoes and things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, I can't hear anybody through the microphone, so if somebody will say something, I'll Hi. test my microphone. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I think that's fine. <laughs> Okay, so we are just waiting for uh, Pippin to uh, get ready and organize. No, sir, uh, just uh, one more minute to go for six o'clock, then. Okay, yeah. I'll just wait. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Balasubramaniam, can I can we start now? I think you should. Yeah. So, the, um, in fact, uh, we have uh, two platforms. One, this one, and uh, we have another YouTube platform, where uh, something like 160 students are actually watching live. And okay. here, it's more of a guess, and uh, people are trickling now. Okay. Uh, we already have some 40 people, but uh, it will go. Uh, I mean, as and when we get in. So, let me start. Sure. Uh, Professor Dixit, can I start? Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, in fact, uh, good morning, uh, Professor Avinash Dixit. Um, and I welcome you all for this um, Base University um, Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, I am Bhanu Murthy, Vice Chancellor of Bangalore, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar School of Economics. 
uh, Unitary University of uh, the Government of Karnataka. Uh, this is a very new university uh, focusing on the research and teaching in economics and related social sciences. Uh, recently, we have initiated a base university distinguished lecture series wherein we invite eminent economists and social scientists to give lectures to our students and for wider audience. Today's is the first lecture under the series and we are very much honored that Professor Avinash Dikshit has agreed to speak on the topic how community institutions can fight corruption, lessons from history and theory. Um, for many of the economists here, they don't need, uh, we don't need to introduce Professor Dikshit, but uh, there are so many students, young students, uh, I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, Professor Dikshit uh, for this audience. Professor Avinash Dikshit is currently John F. John J. F. Sherrod, 52 University Professor of Economics, uh, Emeritus Professor at Princeton University. He is also a Distinguished Adjunct Professor of Economics at uh, Lingnan University, Hong Kong and a Senior Research Fellow at Nuffield College, uh, Oxford. His research interests include microeconomic theory, game theory, international trade, industrial organization, growth and development theories, public economics, political economy, and the new institutional economics. His books publications include Theory of International Trade, The Art of Strategy, uh, Investment and, uh, Under Uncertainty, Games of Strategy, Lawlessness of Economics, Alternative Modes of Governance, and The Making of Economic Policy, a Transaction Cost Politics Perspective. He has also published numerous articles in professional journals and collective volumes. Um, it's very important for me to highlight here, he was president of the Econometric Society in 2001 and the president of the American Economic Association in 2008. He has received many international national awards I'm not going to list all of them, but uh, there are two awards that have been given from India. One uh, that is the Mahan Lobis Memorial Medal uh, for the year 1985 by the Indian Econometric Society. And the most importantly, uh, Padma Vibhushan, uh, second highest civilian award from uh, Republic of India in 2016. He has a very long list of students uh, where he was the primary supervisor. Um, I think many of us know um, there are three uh, important students I thought I would like to highlight. One is Dr. Vijay Kelkar, who was uh, one of the topmost uh, public policy uh, uh, maker in this country. And we had Dr. Kala Krishna and uh, Dr. Danny Roderick. We're extremely happy that Professor Dikshit has agreed to give the first uh, base distinguished lecture series. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We're also happy that uh, this lecture would be chaired by Dr. Bala Subramaniam. Uh, Dr. Bala Subramaniam is the founder and chairman of GRAM, that is Grassroot Research and Advice, Advocacy Movement in Mysore. He is a very well-known development economy, uh, activist, uh, social innovator, writer, and a leadership trainer. He is a medical doctor by training with specialization in public administration from Harvard University. He founded the most very important, the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement at the age of 19 and then went on to work with the displaced and dispossessed forest based tribes in Mysore district. Dr. Bala Subramanian teaches and lectures at various universities across the globe on issues related to leadership, governance and NGOs, poverty and development and global health. He has been bestowed with the honor of being the Rhodes Professor at Cornell University, adjunct professor at the University of Iowa. Over the years, he has served on uh, several central and state government committees. Uh, he has also served as an advisor and consultant to the World Bank, WHO, and many other governments. Um, uh, more than anything else, uh, he is a member of our governing council, and I welcome you, sir, for this um, lecture. Uh, with, without much ado, uh, with the permission of the chair, uh, I'll request Professor Avinash Dikshit to deliver his lecture and I request all the participants to type their questions, comments if they have anything uh, in the chat box so that uh, one of our colleagues uh, can read out um, uh, after the lecture. Uh, over to Professor Dikshit, please. Okay, thank you so much uh, Professor Banu Murthy for that very nice introduction. 
And thank you, Dr. Balasubramanyam, for agreeing to chair. It's an honor for me. It's, in fact, a real honor for me to be invited to speak at the Ambedkar School of Economics. For as long as I can remember, Dr. Ambedkar has been a big heroic figure for me. Uh, his most, most important contribution to the writing of India's constitution reminds one, maybe makes him India's Thomas Jefferson. Uh, his lifelong fight for the Dalits reminds one of people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela. So to speak at a school named after him is really big for me. Thank you for inviting me. My subject today is corruption, and I'm sure people in India need no introduction to that. You've met corruption in your own lives and in news uh, many times. I'm going to focus on one particular aspect, namely how business and community institutions can, and in fact should, play a very important role in fighting corruption. I'll give some examples from history. I'll just a couple of pages of slides indicate um, some theoretical background for what I'm saying. All these things, uh, in fact, I'll have to rush through some slides because of time constraints, but there are background papers that are listed on the last two slides. I assume at some point the uh, slides will be available to the audience on the website and you can follow the details there. And some things will come up in the Q&A that I'm not able to cover in the talk itself. OK, so let's start with uh, the first actual slide, please. Just to begin with uh, the usual definition of corruption, namely the use of public office for private gain or some variance around that. This is very big and broad. And uh, usually one splits it into petty bribery, uh, which can take the form of extortion. For example, something that a citizen is entitled to anyway, but an official can either uh, hold it up or uh, delay it until paid a bribe, things like driver's licenses, or as used to be the case at one time, railway tickets, uh, you've come across that. Second is something that the citizen is not entitled to, something that may actually be forbidden. The official or the bureaucrat will grant a special favor uh, for example, a customs officer will allow an incoming traveler to bring in some contraband in exchange for a bribe. That's the kind of thing that citizens come across most often in their lives. At somewhat bigger level, and this is where businesses most likely uh, meet corruption, is when they need to get a license or a contract for which they have to give a middle level or higher level official a bribe or a kickback. And then there's the really high level grand corruption where uh, the whole government or its agencies get captured by companies or industries in order to make laws, make and apply regulations or things of that kind to favor that firm or that industry, where basically the government, instead of uh, being an impartial social welfare maximizing entity, is a captive of uh, the private interests. Of course, these are conceptual categories, and in practice, they'll overlap. There'll be ambiguous cases. Uh, you can't actually tell, uh, so there might be uh, no explicit payment or quid pro quo. Uh, these are the kind of things where the official is promised, for example, uh, uh, 
big sinecure position after retirement by the company he's favoring. And there can be a kind of implicit insider society where the insiders exchange favors, uh, but no direct payments are made. And in some cases, we we'll see the countries that look very clean as far as the usual categories of uh, corruption are concerned, are in fact these kind of insider societies. Uh, they are uh, rife with crony capitalism. So the next slide, please. Again, very quickly, why is corruption bad? The standard answer is like a tax, but actually worse than a tax, because the rate of tax is usually somewhat uncertain. Even a 30 or 40 percent tax, although it's a deterrent to investment and innovation, is not as bad as not knowing what the rate of tax, the rate of the bribe or kickback will be. And that can happen because there are multiple officials. You think you have bribed everybody and one other person comes along and says, what about me? Or the same guy, like a blackmailer, keeps on making more and more demands. There's a counter argument that's sometimes offered, namely that if the rules of uh, the agencies or the government are bad, if there are, for example, quantitative restrictions that distort economic activity, then corruption can act like a grease in the gears of this and actually improve things from a bad situation and create a little bit less inefficiency, a little bit more economic activity. That may sometimes be true, but that's at most the second best argument. You are saying that uh, the existing situation was third or fourth best and corruption will bring it to second best. Actually, it would be much better to get rid of that distorting policy in the first place. Also, there's a lot of empirical research on this, and that shows that on balance, corruption does have a negative effect on economic outcomes. And also that it's especially important for progressing beyond middle income levels. To go from a low income level to a middle income level, you can have dealings within trust groups in society. Uh, one of your uh, family or village goes and starts a business in the city and brings in people. That can work. But uh, to go beyond middle income levels to higher income levels, you need to deal at larger levels with people who are not within your immediate trust circle. And that needs good laws, good administration, etc. And corruption is an important obstacle there. OK, next slide, please. Few quick facts. This is a nice map about uh, which countries are really rife with corruption and which are good. Nothing surprising there, Canada, um, Northern Europe, New Zealand, Australia are good. The yellow or ochre, China, India, Argentina, etc., somewhere in the middle. Russia quite bad. Alas, a number of African countries really bad. <coughs> the next slide just select some countries to display this. New Zealand and Denmark actually come at the top. You'll see, by the way, that the US is not very good among rich countries. China and India somewhere in the middle. And uh, those in India who might think that India might be the worst, no, not true. Uh, the bottom goes to Somalia, and Nigeria is really, really bad among the big countries. As I said, uh, it's very important to tackle corruption for going from middle income levels to higher income levels. 
And that's why for the middle income countries like China, India, Brazil, it is especially important to make progress in tackling corruption. And that's what my talk is going to be about. OK, next slide, please. Corruption, of course, is a very complex, multidimensional problem. And uh, in history, I'll give some examples. Attempts to combat it have taken many forms using many different kinds of institutions, organizations, coalitions between them, and they have succeeded uh, some more, some less. We'll see a little bit uh, the nature of these differences. But what one eventually needs is to change the whole culture of society, change its values, beliefs, expectations, common knowledge about what other people will do, uh, basically to shift the whole equilibrium of society from one where corruption is just the way things are to one where corruption is seriously frowned on, brings guilt, shame, punishment, etc., which act as a deterrent. Shift equilibrium, that suggests game theory, and I'll say just a little bit about that. Of course, uh, it turns out, we'll see in history, that the progress in combating corruption is going to be quite slow, and success will be on the partial. I always like to say, don't think of corruption as a cancer, where you have to get rid of every malignant cell, otherwise the little ones that remain will just grow and grow and grow and come back. Rather, think of corruption like overweight or obesity, a very good parallel in these times of uh, the coronavirus where gyms are closed and people are shut in at home, it's very difficult to lose weight. We all know that. And uh, you will never really get slim. You do the best you can. Sometimes you backslide. But it's important to keep on doing it. Keep on having a good diet. Keep on good exercise. And see that that actually will improve things although not 100% of your goal, nowhere near. I hope people will keep this kind of uh, analogy in mind when they think about so corruption. Sure. OK, next slide, please. This brings me to my almost most important theme of this talk, that we should not expect the government to lift the whole 100% weight in combating corruption. Why not? Because the main gainers from corruption are the very politicians and officials who make and implement policy. So surely they are going to resist attempts at reform. They'll make weak laws, they'll enforce them weakly, and sometimes they'll actually be the obstacle, not the solution to the problem. Of course, it's a little bit like a zero-sum game. If those people are gaining, then citizens and firms on balance must be the ones losing. But that's for the collectivity of citizens and firms. Each one of them might think, ah, I can gain a step over the others by giving a bribe or uh, engaging in other forms of corruption. So. This sounds like a prisoner's dilemma, and indeed some of my ideas will be how to tackle this prisoner's dilemma, where each citizen or each firm pursuing their own interest leads to a bad outcome for all of them. And as with prisoner's dilemma, the problem is they're individually helpless in the force of this uh, operating system, but collectively they're strong. Always, when I mention fight through community action against corruption, people say, Saab, what can one do? I'm helpless when the official or the policeman demands a bribe. Yes, individually you are helpless, but collectively you are strong. We'll see examples. OK, let's have the next slide. 
since corruption is complex and multidimensional, methods to fight it also take many forms. There can be top-down methods where the country's top leadership enacts and enforces laws. Uh, rarely does this work uh, entirely, as I said. And there are bottom-up methods uh, where there can be social movements, social media, etc., that bring the collectivity together. There can be ex ante action, where you select officials in the right kind of way, you deter the temptation to demand and pay bribes, etc., and there can be ex post methods to detect corruption when it's occurring and to punish it. These are not exclusive. In fact, they have to go together. We can have the formal legal system. We can have semi-independent anti-corruption agencies that have been attempted in many countries. And my focus, business and community associations. And what I will argue is that one needs a combination of these things, coalitions between them, to have much hope of success. OK, next slide, please. Let me begin with an old example of the Italian city-states in late medieval times. What they did was to hire a manager for the city called the Podesta from the outside. And it was a very cleverly designed system to align incentives. The Podesta was appointed for a limited term, sometimes even as little as one year. He brought his own staff from the outside. He paid a deposit to get this position. And the deposit was returned, plus a fee at the end, with deductions if problems were seen. These people had to stay in the palace. They were quite luxuriously accommodated, but they weren't allowed to mix socially with citizens of the city uh, because otherwise they would kind of uh, <clears throat> develop favoritism, make friends, etc. The services that the city manager, the Podesta, organized, payments for these services, citizens made directly to the providers, not through the city manager, who might then kind of uh, keep a little for himself. Really cleverly designed system, read about it. Uh, it's almost a puzzle why it disappeared. Maybe something like that could be revived, and maybe something like that could be a little bit related to the idea that Paul Romer devised for what he called charter cities, his idea was different. He wanted to give the management role to kind of high probity, high integrity people like uh, Sweden or something like that. Uh, Italians didn't rely on that. They uh, designed incentives and very cleverly too. OK, let's carry on. Next slide. The examples from other European countries uh, through medieval times and later, some kind of crisis happened and that upended society, more or less in the way that Mansur Olsen talks about in his uh, books. In Denmark, there was a catastrophic defeat in a war. In England and France, there were civil wars, French Revolution. And what these things often did was to reduce the power of the corrupt aristocracy. And the king or the citizens committee uh, made a more meritocratic solution for administrators and gradually developed training methods for these, leading to a professional cadre of uh, administrators, bureaucrats, that was, again, not 100%, but less corrupt than the aristocracy had previously been. 
Many transition economies since the collapse of the Soviet empire have tried uh, anti-corruption agencies and uh, things of this kind. They have a mixed record. And the ones that succeeded are broadly characterized by their civil society being strong. They having freedom of speech, freedom of press, transparency of administration, all these things turn out to be important. A uh, Romanian uh, lawyer economist by the name of uh, Mungio Pipidi has written about these and uh, her book is listed in the references at the end. I highly recommend it. Next slide, please. The US uh, 150 years ago was an extremely corrupt country and corruption dropped for various reasons a combination. Investigative journalists and the progressive movement of Theodore Roosevelt and people like him played a part in switching policy to interests of broad society as a whole. Some private interests captured the policy process and tried to get deregulation. But incidentally, as a byproduct, that led to greater competition and greater competition kept corruption down. Then there were political entrepreneurs. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt in particular shifted a lot of welfare payments to the federal level, and that reduced the role of uh, local politicians practicing favoritism, clientelism, uh, that also helped. All of these combined, the synergy between all these. But there wasn't a great deal of explicit coalition building between them. We'll see some explicit coalition building in a minute. Some Asian countries, Singapore rates very, very highly on corruption ratings. It used to be awfully corrupt to the point where the police were involved in opium trades and there was a big scandal in the 1950s. An anti-corruption body was formed. And most, most importantly, Lee Kuan Yew, who became prime minister, played a big role in supporting this, taking actions, mostly top-down actions, strong laws, penalties for those who were caught, with little coalition building from the larger civil society. This is a rare example of almost purely top down. So if for any country almost, if you want to get a dictator to rule you, get Lee Kuan Yew. Very few others like him. Later, as Singapore became richer, it was able to offer high salaries to civil servants, and that acted like an efficiency wage they were paid much better than they would in alternative occupations. And if they're found to be corrupt, they're fired. So the fear of losing that uh, high salary uh, kept them honest. Singapore will, may have been helped by being small, but part of penalty for being small is that it's an insider society. It gets very good ratings for bribery, etc. But it gets very poor ratings for its crony capitalism. Corruption is multidimensional and acts differently. Hong Kong also used to be extremely corrupt. The police were involved and actually a chief of police, a high level policeman actually, a Brit, not a local, <clears throat> was caught and that created a big scandal. A new governor had just come in, Murray McElhose, and he formed and backed a commission against corruption. To start with, this commission faced big, big difficulties. It had faced a lot of resistance from police, civil service, etc. But there were actually fist fights between members of the commission and police. But gradually, the commission built 
a high reputation. And it did this with a very big active campaign of public relations and education. Most importantly, teaching values of good governance to school children. So when the school children grew up, they came into a society <clears throat> where the culture was transformed. So this is a very nice example of mixing top down and bottom up methods, building coalitions. It helped, by the way, that Hong Kong was a very free and open economy. So there's much less rent in the economy for uh, people to seek and get favors from the government. But still something of an insider society, uh, Hong Kong government allocates land for building and insiders are very much favored in that. Next slide, please. Now here's a pure bottom up move. This is in Sicily against the mafia's extortion. The mafia had this or has extorting mechanism called the pizza, where businesses have to pay pizza to the mafia. Otherwise, their store will be burned down. The owner might have his kneecap smashed or might even be killed. <clears throat> a group of young people started a social movement out of nowhere where they got businesses to pledge that they would not pay pizza. There was a decal, this establishment does not pay pizza and consumers were encouraged to go only to those stores. So they had good publicity campaign, good slogans. They invoked honor and dignity, that it's against honor and dignity to pay pizza. Turning on its head, the mafia's attempt previously to say that uh, it was against honor and dignity to go to the police. This movement has had reasonable success over 12 years. Actually, only 10% of businesses have signed up. But most, most importantly, the mafia has not retaliated against any of them. If a single business person said, I'm not going to pay pizza when the mafia also came around, he would be in a very bad state, maybe killed or store burned down. But collectively, no. In fact, the mafiosi were caught on tape as complaining about this movement. What are we going to do? Our people will have to get ordinary jobs, etc. But they have not burned any of those decal stores. They have not. Um, and by the way, this association monitors these stores to make sure they're not on the sly paying the pizza anyway. And they have got rid of a few that have been caught trying that. Incidentally, they have succeeded better among small businesses and younger consumers. So maybe this will go. The key thing about audio pizza, as I said, is the strength in collectivity. The decal says not merely that I'm not going to pay pizza, but that I belong to an organization. And if you retaliate against me, this whole organization will be on your uh, tail. So uh, similar things have been tried in India, the zero rupee note that also similarly says, uh, I belong to this organization. It's had much less success, I hear, but maybe something worth trying in different ways. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, in a whole lot of other countries, there have been uh, attempts to set up uh, anti-corruption agencies. And looking over a whole lot of them, what are the success requirements? Some are uh, the association, the uh, agency has to maintain its own reputation for honesty and clean uh, behavior. They have to build alliances with whatever uh, bureaucrats, politicians will ally with them, with media, with civil society, and even with international institutions. They have to run an education campaign to change the norms and expectations of the public. 
they have to balance between aggressively pursuing big clear cases and slower, low profile strategies like education and so on. Uh, if they pursue no big cases, people will say, oh, what are they doing? But if they don't do the educational campaigns, then the future will not be so good. So they'd have to allocate their resources between these in the right way. And they don't, they shouldn't go for a zero tolerance approach. They should like losing weight try and do it bit by bit. OK, next slide, please. So I'm suggesting that community institutions of this kind should be formed. Can't rely on government. You have to maybe need some little support from politicians, but have to play a big role through the community through business associations. And business associations can set up a self-governing system, have an anti-corruption norm, and any business, member or not, who's seen to be corrupt, faces sanctions from members of this group in the form of, for example, not doing business with them. For success, succeeding in this, there are a whole lot of uh, requisites that uh, immediately come to mind. First of all, you must avoid false accusations. You need good information about who's corrupt and who's clean. You need to get the support from really top business people so that sanctions inflicted by dumb will have a real bite. This kind of an association shouldn't itself become an insider's clique. And idealism, though it's important, is not enough. You need good management and organizational skills. And to my mind, that was a little bit what was wrong with movements like Lokpal. They had idealism, but they did not have good management skills. If someone with good management skills, for example, someone like Nandan Nilkani, who organized that whole uh, uh, smart ID movement and put it through, no matter what you think of its outcome, you have to admire his management skill. If someone like that came in charge of uh, a Lokpal-like movement, I think the outcome will be very different. Okay, next slide, please. So coalitions have to be built. Uh, among all these uh, different bodies in the community that can take action. Members should volunteer to speak, um, build a corruption and against corruption culture in the society, generate visibility, some kind of pride about uh, being clean, shame about being corrupt, uh, take some shame about... Uh, bad ranking in international tables, all that kind of thing will slowly, slowly build up to have some effect. Next slide, please. So let me very briefly talk a little bit about theory. I mentioned the prisoner's dilemma. Again, the business community as a whole is generally a net loser from bribery, but each individual business stands to gain. So that's the prisoner's dilemma game and we can have a norm of no bribery and sanctions for uh, people who are known to violate this norm. I have a theoretical paper on this mentioned uh, at the end. And the interesting thing about that is that this kind of uh, norm and sanction system proves complementary to the state's legal system. The effect of both of them being in place is better than some of uh, them acting separately. And that's an encouraging thing on favor of this. Okay, next slide, please. But actually, when I was trying this out in India a few uh, years ago, the business people, some business people there said, 
things are better than that. It's better than a prisoner's dilemma. Because especially young people, especially smart young people, are already ashamed of the level of corruption. They want to work for companies that are clean. They want to patronize the businesses that are clean. And you marshal this together, and you can have a virtuous circle movement where if other firms are clean, it's better for you to be clean also, because then you can attract the very smartest people to work for you. So you'll have lower turnover costs and higher productivity, and also consumers, especially young consumers, and the more affluent consumers will favor you. So this makes it into a game of assurance, where which has two equilibria. If everybody is corrupt, you have to be corrupt also. If many others are clean, it's better for you to be clean also. Otherwise, you'll lose out in getting workers and uh, consumers. So you give the system an initial push to the point where the positive feedback loop, the virtual circle, goes round and round, and you move to the better of the two equilibria of this assurance game. Of course, to have that, you have to create good knowledge, reliable knowledge about who's corrupt and who's not. You need a system to rate firms who are non-corrupt, who are clean, etc. Rather like the Michelin star system for restaurants. So these are three-star clean firms, some not so good two-star firms, etc. And uh, some firms might ultimately have no stars at all. Okay, next slide, please. And I think that this is the kind of thing where youth can play an especially important role. They can favor the clean firms in their job search and in buying from. They can pressure their parents, elders, friends, etc., to do likewise overall create a sense of shame about being corrupt, use their special skills in modern technology to identify who is corrupt and who is clean. An idea might be a website where you go to a meeting, uh, say with a policeman or an official with your uh, mobile, with its camera, and if the person demands a bribe, you instantly post a little uh, video with audio of this on a website. And of course, uh, the, the guy you're talking to will be mad, but it's too late to do anything. The video is already up there. And uh, if he then punishes you, that will make it even worse for him. OK, uh, you should vote for politicians who will actually do something about corruption, not just talk. They can campaign. They can actually actively uh, run against the corrupt politicians. So I think that India's youth have a really big role to play in this, and I hope uh, they will. OK, the last of my slides of uh, the text to sum up. Corruption is really an obstacle in going beyond the middle income level. So at the moment, it's really especially important for countries like India. We can't wait for the government to do the job. Business and community associations, using youth in particular, have an important role to play in changing the society's culture. It's a slow process. Outcomes will not be perfect. It's like fighting overweight, not like fighting cancer. But again, people tell me when I offer a solution, oh, this is not going to work 100%. And I say, hey, if you keep waiting for a 100% solution, that will only ensure that you will get 0%. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Avinash, for that wonderful talk. We have a set of questions already. And uh, uh, you had a discussion with uh, Professor Sudipto Mandal already. Uh, I will take up that question first. 
Yes. So, Professor Sudhir Thomandal raised the following question. Efforts to promote business organizations or institution to curb corruption, in which Professor Dixit himself has played a vital role, have not succeeded so far, though it would serve their collective interest. Is there something missing in the structure of incentives required to make this happen? What may be required to make this happen uh, going forward? He's also talking about uh, the fear of being sued uh, was a major concern for ourselves, especially those who were planning to initiate a rating system. The concern of the business leaders themselves who consulted, as I recall, was sanctions from their peers for taking up such an initiative, which could be offered for many of them. So business leaders were very encouraging, but did not themselves want to be seen as leading it or being actively associated with it. Now, what it would take to get some of these business leaders, known for their standards of probity, to be prepared to lead such an effort, assuming the risk of being sued is adequately dealt with? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's a very good uh, question to start. Uh, as you said, uh, hmm? uh, Mr. and <clears throat> no. uh, some associates uh, did Huh? Discuss the Please setting so. up of this kind of Michelin star rating agency. And a big obstacle they came up against was the fear of lawsuits. That a firm that was not given any stars or was given only one star might say that we've suffered a uh, huge loss because of this and pay us billions of rupees bring up the lawsuit in some little corner of India, <clears throat> uh, so uh, tie up your uh, legal resources, etc., etc. Uh, I'm sure you people are more familiar with these kind of tactics than I am. Here is where a little bit of help from the top is needed. What's needed is a law that ensures that an agency that transparently publishes the rules of its rating system and <clears throat> follows them in a transparent way is immune from these lawsuits. In fact, uh, in countries where there's a little bit more of um, I don't know how to describe it, uh, not such a, a legal uh, <clears throat> antagonistic culture. The Michelin system itself has not been plagued by lawsuits. There have been very occasional ones, but that's not proof to be a problem. Another thing that has to happen is that such a rating agency has to be an independently established body with a governing body consisting not just of people from the business association, but from the legal community, from the uh, academic community, etc., independently of uh, any business association imposing sanctions. As for sanctions, I want to be clear that sanctions will be imposed on a business that's found to be corrupt, whether or not a member of this business association. So it should not be the case that merely by staying out of the association, you stay out of sanctions. The business community is the one that tells its members to inflict sanctions on badly rated businesses, member or not. So you need a little bit of help from the top. You need uh, good transparency. You need uh, good integrity within the rating agency and the business association itself. But with all these things, I don't see any reason why it should not work. Important to get the topmost people to come in as a start, because then sanctions imposed by them, their big firms, 
will have a bigger bite. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for that response. Uh, we have another question from uh, Rajiv uh, Sutradhar from Christ University. Uh, his question is, as the society moves towards market-based economic transactions, many community-based organizations itself suffers decline, weakening their ability to fight corruption. How do you see in such context community-based organizing fighting corruption? Actually, in a way, a move toward market-based um, economies will reduce the importance of rent in the economy. And if that happens, corruption will automatically become a little bit less of a problem. But secondly, market-based economics or neoliberal economics, as it's often called and criticized, has often gone kind of way, way too far to my mind. Uh, it's as if markets are the magic, governments are the only problem, and uh, left to themselves, the markets will do just fine. And if people who say these things, and there are many of them in the US, there are several of them in India, if that really read Adam Smith, their original hero, they would have seen that he was much more cautious. He was not in favor of letting markets go completely unchanged, it is uh, unchallenged. It is important to have oversight of markets. It's important to have oversight by government agencies. It's important to have oversight by community associations. Uh, as market economies develop, it remains important for NGOs, for social media, for organizations of youth to play their role in uh, all kinds of checks and balances. So although there is a danger that pure worship of markets will lead to the kind of problem the questioner is uh, raising, with care, that need not happen. OK, uh, so the next question is uh, related to the you know, specific uh, scenario from India, uh, where uh, the question is, do you think that the corruption in India is more visible after economic reforms involving chronic capitalists who make huge profit that cost income inequality. The black economy is more prominent even after the demonetization. Uh, capitalists and politicians are involved in hand in glove for uh, and hand in glove, and the whistleblowers are being targeted and even killed. Given this situation, how can public fight the corruption in India, and uh, how, how is it possible? Um, I think that's in a way mixing a couple of things. I'm not sure that demonetization at least directly bears on this issue. But crony capitalism, yes, that's a big problem. Uh, and as we saw, that problem persists even in countries that are otherwise very clean, like Singapore. Uh, many of the things that I have been describing are more effective against petty corruption and the mid-level licensing and contracts corruption. They will not directly bear on the topmost level of uh, grand corruption. That's a little bit more of a political problem. The way in which uh, the kind of things I'm describing will help indirectly is that they'll begin to change the culture to a level where corruption is generally commonly understood, recognized to be a bad thing. And as that happens, gradually, hopefully, grand corruption will come down 
also. But no, that's a valid point. And if even Singapore, which in other ways is so good, retains its crony capitalism, I don't think that India will be able to go to the level that uh, we'll, we'll, we would be able to say that there's no crony capitalism any longer. Okay, uh, thank you for answering those questions. There are a set of other questions as well, but uh, given the time constraint, I won't take it up right now. Uh, maybe I can email you some of the questions. If you have time, maybe you can give a response for those questions. Now, I request uh, Dr. Marbalu Subramanian to give his uh, chairman address. Thank you, uh, Professor Dixit. It's such a wonderful listening to you. And as you were going slide after slide, it, uh, at several slides, I got the feeling of deja vu. Uh, one of the one of the unfortunate uh, experiences I have had is having been a special investigator in the Lokayukta when Justice Santosh Egade chaired it and headed it between 2006 and 2011. And the concept of coalition that you were talking about was something which he tried by bringing a rank outsider from civil society into the system and uh, enabling me under the law to actually look at investigations. And... Uh, uh, virtually every slide that you said was validating some of my own experiences and I realized how things could have been done better, how things could have been possibly handled differently and assuming that an institutional mechanism like Loka Ekta could actually, and in those days Karnataka had this, 13 states had their law and now every state has got it and Karnataka was supposed to be one of the strongest and my conviction rate was 0%. That shows how strong the act was. I'm specifically re recalling these experiences to sort of share and give a life and validity to, to all the papers that you have mentioned and the excellent talk that you gave, Professor Dixit. Uh, uh, it was, you know, uh, the last investigation that I did was on the corruption and the public distribution system, a, a, a corruption which touches the life of every single man in the state. And Karnataka had fine-tuned it. Uh, I discovered to my... Uh, sort of, I wouldn't say surprised actually, I was even stunned and astonished that Karnataka have the population of 1.2 crore families, 12 million families had technically supposed to be six crore population, had actually managed to distribute 1.6 crore ration cards. Uh, they'd actually distributed 4 million more ration cards in the population itself. Uh, and it was strange that at that point of time, 90% of Karnataka could be labeled as below poverty line, a progressive state like Karnataka. The inclusion error was close to 53%. The exclusion error was close to 5%. The real deserving poor were excluded, but a lot of undeserving people were included. And I thought it ended there, but the reality was the ghost cards of 40 lakhs, rations were being drawn. And directly siphoned away by the system and distributed outside. And on one side, I thought the mechanism of the state could never fight itself. And at that point of time, I could only locate one honest officer in the department. And I sat with him and asked him and said, these are my recommendations for streamlining this. These are the mechanism in which we can actually set right everything. I'd actually identified corruption at several levels, at the point of sales, at the directly the point of procurement, storage, distribution, at every level, transportation, and given figures and ratios, and I thought I'd develop a fascinating economic paper out of it. But then that officer told me something blunt and direct, which validates what you said till now. He said, if you think the system is going to respond, you're a fool. The system is deliberately great. It's not that people in the system don't know how to make it better. They don't need your report. It will always be kept gray. It will be deliberately gray because the system doesn't want to change itself. The investment in the corrupt process are so strong and deep, it will not change. And that's the point when I realized possibly how do you manage the whole thing? And then fast forwarding eight to 10 years where the institution of Lokayakta itself became corrupt in Karnataka, where the head of the Lokayakta was actually nearly jailed and then dismissed and all that happened. And subsequently, using that as an excuse, the state actually decapitated the entire Lokayukta and just separated out the anti-corruption powers, made a separate bureau and made it reportable to the chief minister of the state. Now you can understand whether even any anti-corruption work would happen in Karnataka. So institutional responses is something like a myth, like you what yourself said. 
But on the other hand, social accountability processes, and that's something which at least last three decades of my work with people and empowering them and getting them to demand. I had a very strange example, and I cannot even romanticize and say communities can take on the responsibilities. I remember in some of the tribal areas where I worked, they, those days they would get 28 kilograms of rice. It still was not free. There's no free subsidy. And that There's a larger subsidy, but not free. They were getting it at three rupees a kilogram. And one day when I went to the colony, some of the women there told me they are now getting 14 kgs of rice free of cost. I was quite, uh, uh, I couldn't understand and rec reconcile to this because if people are supposed to be getting 28 kilograms at three rupees, I didn't see a newspaper notification. I didn't see an advertisement which normally all populist governments do to give free rice free. And then I called up the lo local deputy commissioner and asked him, when did this new scheme get introduced? He said, there's no such scheme. And when I got into the details of it, I realized the local food inspector had to remit to the government treasury 84 rupees for 28 kilograms of rice. He was meticulously cutting a bill for 84 rupees, paying it out of his pocket, giving 14 kilograms of rice to the people and selling 14 kilograms of rice at 20 rupees a kilogram. To the market. So he was selling it at 280 rupees, paying 84 out of it, keeping 196 rupees. I went and met the buyer, the local hotel, and he said, market rate of rice is 30 rupees. I'm saving 10 rupees. So it is actually a win-win-win situation. The state got its 84 rupees. The food inspector got his money. The tribal got free rice. The hotelier got cheap rice. So who is the loser in this? And it's so difficult to understand and comprehend the complex dimensions that you said. And I thought this example brings out when communities and citizens get co-opted in the battle against corruption, when they start delivered, uh, getting a stake and the state can also enable citizens to get a stake into it. And it's so, you know, you suddenly realize that co-opting people into the corrupt mechanisms is far easier than co-opting them into the battle against corruption. That is my experience in the India against corruption uh, battle that I had. So I finally would like to say the only thing is the solutions that you offer, Professor Dixit. Fighting corruption is one way. Fighting for people to stay honest is possibly the best way forward. And businesses, they have their own challenges. Chronic capitalism has got its own challenges. Possibly, I would frame it as a question. I would frame it as a food for thought for all the audience. Is an economic model itself fundamentally wired to actually the, the entire model of money being the principal mechanism in which our lives are measured? Is that a problem? Or suppose we move towards a stakeholder economy or a for-benefit economy where everybody looks at not just profit maximization, but at benefit optimization for all of us. Will that is, maybe it's a utopian dream, it may never happen, but finally a combination of methods that you mentioned, a coalition of processes, bringing in citizen groups into the system, bringing in state mechanisms, with headed by our people who are actually intent on, like the Hong Kong example that you gave, and various social accountability processes, building partnerships in this fight is what can possibly take us further. So thank you again, Professor Dixit. It was such a privilege and a pleasure. For me personally, it's such a privilege to be chairing a session in which you're speaking. Your work is legendary and it's a great opportunity for all of us on the panel. And I think I congratulate Professor Banu Murthy, the Vice Chancellor, for starting off the Distinguished Lecture Series with an extraordinarily distinguished economic legend Whose, whose work is sort of, uh, you know, a real privilege for us to just read. And now listening to you in person, online at least, has been something extraordinary. I think it's a great beginning. So I congratulate the Bates University and the Vice Chancellor for this initiative. And I'm sure that in the coming days, he'll have such equally well-known people and distinguished people from around the world to share their work, share their knowledge, and enlighten all of us. So thank you again. Thank you. I, I also take the opportunity to organize us for putting all this together. And uh, personally, thank Professor Dixit again. Thank you so much. Namaste. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bal Subramanian. Uh, obviously, you were the correct chair for this occasion. Uh, can I, in 30 seconds, come back on the point you mentioned about uh, the community being corralled into the web of corruption? Uh, that's an interesting problem that I had not tackled so far, but um, a possible 
inroad against that is education for children right from an early age. And an example I would give is uh, anti-smoking. A number of parents who smoked were moved by their children at school being taught about the evils of smoking and coming back home and saying, Daddy, um, why are you killing yourself? This is such a bad thing to do. I want you to be around in my life. And that had an effect on people. Something like that could be done. But um, again, I keep emphasizing, this is like losing weight. It's a tough battle. You have to make progress step by step, pound by pound, ounce by ounce. Thank you. Thank you so much for that clarification. Okay, that was a wonderful session which uh, looked into the central aspects of corruption. And we are happy to note that all of you attended the first lecture of the Bangalore Dr. B.R. Ambedkar School of Economics Distinguished Lecture Series. For a new institution like us, which is a three year old, this is a huge encouragement. On behalf of Bates University, I thank all the participants uh, from different institutions across the country. We are happy to have uh, Dr. Avinash Dixit to deliver the first Bates University Distinguished Lecture. Specifically, you talked on a topic which kept the nation on tender hooks a few years back and still remains a big concern. But I'm sure that the participants have greatly benefited from this talk. Uh, thank you, Professor Avinash Dixit, for the insightful lecture. Uh, Dr. Al Balas Subramaniam is a well wisher of Bates University. He is a member of the Governing Council and he has always been encouraging any initiative taken by the university. It was interesting to uh, listen to someone who actually worked on the field uh, to tackle corruption issues. Thank you, Dr. Balas Subramaniam. And we hope to see you in the new campus when the um, normalcy returns. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, a few of the students who helped us in organizing the event. Lavish for designing the poster, Naman and Mohan for all the tech assistance. And uh, in the coming days, uh, Bayes University will be organizing more events. Uh, the next event that is scheduled uh, for 18th February is a panel discussion on the Union Budget uh, 2020. We look forward for your participation in that program as well. Thank you all.